This is Jonathan Mickles with the Strategic Multifamily Investing Podcast. And today I have with me a guest for a second time, the one of the world's most preeminent. Uh, and no, seriously, he really is. He really yeah. is one of the world's most preeminent um, authorities on risk management. Uh, Mr. Carl Pritchett. How you doing, Carl? I'm good. How are you? Doing quite well. And for those who just don't know Carl, please feel free to do, check him out on his LinkedIn profile. Uh, for about 25 plus years, you you were working as a trainer and a consultant with the with the prestigious Project Management Institute, right? Which mm -hmm. is the gold standard, if you will, of project management. You, you go ahead, talk yeah. to me about that. How how did you actually? Do uh, I'm back. Uh, oh. PMI after um, after I was diagnosed with cancer, they you know they they said it's okay and they cut me loose, and um, I have had a very good set of fortunes with my oncologists and everything else. And when I was feeling up to it, they said, do you, do you want to come back? And I was like, yeah. And uh, so I'm back. I am back with PMI. I am teaching for them again. Wow. I'm doing um, a couple of half day classes. And now starting this season, they've actually got new one hour classes that PMI Global is offering, and I'm doing those as well. Well, got three of those coming up. I will definitely be on those, uh, getting my PDUs and, and listening to to your humor. If you have not had a class with uh, Mr. Carl Pritchett, you need to, especially if you're a project manager uh, like me. Um, but more importantly, if you're interested in doing risk management, these things can be applied to multiple domains, especially within real estate as well. So. Carl, you, you mentioned your diagnosis here. I think we, we talked about this uh, briefly last time we talked. You were diagnosed with stage four cancer, correct? Right. And I, I still have it. Stage four means it's incurable. It means that it has metastasized. I, I love that word. Um, to other chunks of your body and so forth. And originally they gave me, they said, well, Two years on the inside, you know, you could go as long as 10 if you're very, very fortunate. And uh, kicker was, it's that's been two and a half years ago. And, oh, what do you know? I'm still breathing. And uh, the good news is that now my prognosis is 10 to 15 years treatments. And I've gone under <laughs> every, I have more ologists than any human should and and it's all going real well. They're now saying I've got 10 to 15 years and I'm thinking, good, gives me plenty of time to get hit by the bus or something <laughs> else and, uh, you know, die with cancer rather than from it, which is uh, a perfectly good thing. Well, you know, Carl, one of the things that I, I really, you know, honor about you is that you have humor and actually having humor in such a, you know, generally what most people would say a very bleak diagnosis would be and you know, where does that come from? I mean, if you don't mind me asking that a little bit, how, how do you get there? Mom, um, and it's true. It is my mother. Uh, my mother's, one of her mantras was, uh, you never know that tomorrow might not be the best day of your entire life. And she would beat that into us as children. And 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 frankly, it's it's one of those things. It, it ties to risk and opportunity. It ties to um, investing. It ties to everything. You don't know. You know, for all the crystal balling that we all do. Oh, by the way, I have to show you this. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, I got my own crystal ball now. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, but for all the crystal balling that we do, uh, we we don't know. Yeah, because there are mornings when you wake up and you wake up going, oh, man, my my face hurts. And sure enough, by the end of the day, you're going, oh, I will never be able to repeat that day. Wow, that was amazing. And you don't know. And, and I think to squander that with kind of an Eeyore-like attitude is just so horribly wrong and, and that's why if, if you ask where does that come from it comes from mom because in the back of my head i can still hear her voice god rest her soul but i can still hear her going honey you know and it's like when she used to say that it was it was always the the i'm about to distribute sage wisdom here and she'd go honey and it was like yes mother yeah so 
but that's Understood. where that comes from. Now, do you have like a daily practice where you're cultivating? You have like a morning routine, you know, where you help cultivate that, you know, before you jumping on a podcast or whatever else you're doing, you're teaching, you're educating? This is my daily routine. What is this that? Is, it's a checklist. I um. By the way, if you're looking for a great book on this, it's the checklist. I'm just manifesto. looking on my shelf yes. for it. Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. And wow, what an what a powerful and amazing book! What a, what a, just just profound and and I've always lived with this checklists and let me just squeeze it up here and see if there I don't know yep. if you can see that fifteen is tri triumph yeah anytime I get fifteen check marks in the course of a day that's a very good day and and the beauty of it is that way you never get to the end of the day going did I do anything today because that that gets so frustrating because you're thinking I, i've been i've been doing busy work i've been answering phone calls i've been dealing with email and yeah you know, it's all tedious and yet the reality is you probably did some really good stuff and this is this is fundamentals of project management it's is breaking work down into manageable chunks and without my checklist i would feel like a useless sack I, I I really would, wow. but because so, I mean, of my checklist, you, I know. Do you create it at night, or are you doing it during the morning when you're creating it, or how, how does that work? I've <laughs> I've got the the standard, and a lot of the stuff that's on here is stuff that, quite frankly, I do almost every day. One is um, to either prepare bread or break bake bread. I do one or the other every single day. I, I'm a baker. I'm an artisan bread baker. I love baking. My wife and I this morning were having our coffee with a nice little slice of fresh out of the oven bread, a little bit of real butter. You never use margarine for crying out loud. Exactly. And, and uh, but we were sitting having our coffee this morning, and it's one of those things where it's it's just that's 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 magical. And and I put it on my list. Why? Because. You know, quite frankly, I want to. I want to know that I took the time to do things for us. You know, the things that matter for us. One of the other things on here that's a for me kind of thing: ten thousand steps. Mm. I've gotten on that bandwagon, and uh, ten thousand steps so far, twenty twenty four. Every day, ten thousand steps. I haven't missed a one yet. Wow. So yeah. So I'm, I'm like, and this is, this goes to what my doctors want me doing, to what I want me doing, and it goes to just, you know, general health. And here's outline and objectives for clients' decision-making course, um, archive one month's worth of phone photos, wow. uh, send out 500 emails for a Hood College event, those kind of things. But You've it's, got a lot of things on there. And so, and it's so interesting that you started that whole list of things with things that brought you satisfaction, not necessarily that were all business and I've got to do that. Yeah. You know, those things came later. They're part of your day, but they aren't the sole thing that's that's in your day. No. And they, and that's the thing. People forget that they count, you know, your stuff genuinely counts. It really does. And whether it's, um, you know, Hey, I, I took time off to, uh, to play my favorite game online or whatever it was, you know, 20 minutes of that. Good for you. You know, give yourself some credit for it because you need that decompressed time to actually be more powerful at work. And without that, you're probably cheating yourself. I, I love these people who are like, I'm working and I'm working 24 seven and it, get, get a life. For crying out loud, that's so, you know, so you're, you're definitely anti hustle culture necessarily. You know, yeah. I mean, you you believe in getting things done, but you, you've got to have enjoyment in life in that. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If I haven't done the daily crossword in the Washington Post, I I feel deprived. I, I really, no, I, I I do. And and by the way, for that, it's it's a matter of can I get it done in under five minutes? That's oh. that's yeah. Oh yeah, I. The uh, uh, wordsmith, uh, definitely. Yeah, I got you. Cognitive abilities, you're there. Yeah. Wow. Well, and so, well, my listen, wife says that's why I get beat up on the playground. 
Well, I don't know. I think in life now you are you're definitely yes, you know, knocking them out like Tyson. I mean, you've your your career is very storied and um, you know, very uh honored. Um and we thank you again for all that you do within uh the project management community and and the other communities. One of the things that um uh you're doing as a re result of your your progress and your your journey right now is you started you know, blogging on LinkedIn, and you've turned that set of blog stuff into a book, I think, right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's at the publishers, even as we speak. And uh, it should be on Amazon uh, post-haste. So, uh, and it's the stage four project is the title of it. So that'll be out there available. And it's, I broke it down into nice little digestible blogs and the blogs became the book. So it's uh, 54 blogs. It's about 200 pages. Now, and is this all risk management, project management, heavy duty kind of stuff? Or what What kind of book is this? It is whatever came into my head. I'll, I'll tell you, it it bothered me because my, um, my great aunt Clara passed away. And when she did, we, we went up and we were cleaning out the estate. And one of the things that was there was Aunt Clara's diaries. And her diaries were compelling because she was fastidious about it. She wrote every single day. But all she did was give stats, you know, ate at the club, uh, you know, and it was like one liners that had no context. Hmm. And I thought about Clara and I thought about her life and I thought, how unfortunate that her context is lost. You know, we have no idea, you know, great, she went to the club. Did she golf? Did she win? Did she have a triumphant moment? You know, those kinds of things are lost. We'll never know. And my wife, you know, thumbed through, God bless her, my wife thumbed through virtually every one of Clara's diaries looking for nuggets and realistically got a sense of the life of the woman in terms of activity but little else. And as I looked through them, I was like, wow, you know, I hope my, I never leave this for my kids. I, I want them to have context. I want them to have an understanding. I want my family to know, oh, that's who that guy was. I never <laughs> want that to be in doubt. And basically the collection of blogs is a collection of the context. It's, it's stories, and each one has lessons learned attached to it, because we're project managers and we must have lessons learned. But um, everyone has lessons learned attached to it, and they're basically a collection of little vignettes, if you will, out of my life, between eight and 1,200 words each. And by the way, if you're going to start doing this, if you want to do it for yourself or for your family, let me just suggest to you, Eight to 1,200 words is the standard duration for a blog. Hmm. If you're ever wondering, how, how long should a blog be? And I've had people say, would you mind reading my blog? And I'll pull up their blog, and it's two or 3,000 words. Hmm. And, and it's <laughs> just, it's like, wow, that's, uh, that's a lot. You're asking me to invest more than I'm ready to invest. But if you keep it between eight and 1,200, the nice thing is that's digestible. It's something people can engage in. Mm -hmm. It's something where people can get a nugget out of, which is what I desperately wanted out of Clara's diaries. And, um, you know, it's just it's just a good place to go. And as such, that's that's one of those things that I really wanted to have happen. I wanted to uh, I wanted to actually give my my context for a lot of the stories. And, yeah, I would hope that they're written in sufficient fashion that there's enough of a business paint to them that any any business person reading it would go, oh, I could I could do that. I could leverage that on my job. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. This is, and that's kind of what I was gunning for. No, that that that's great. I I, I think about the uh, the quote that comes from uh, the Bible that says, "Call the young because they're strong. Call the old because they know the way." And so you're you're helping to show the way by the context that you've acquired over this time. And so I want to say thank you for that. I will be going to go pre-order mine today after this call. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe I'll uh, get you to sign one for me or something. You know, with a song I think that in my heart. That would be awesome, man. I am I'm definitely a fan of yours. But one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on um, today was because I was watching one of the, uh, the the podcasts that you were doing for Southern Maryland Project Management Institute. And um, your uh, your co-guest, if you will, that was there, uh, mentioned the post-it notes that we see alongside your wall there. And he said, yeah, Carl does things in bite-sized nuggets. And I said, Carl, what is that that he's talking about? Can you explain what that is and, and tell us? And I, and I know that you've got some some good uh, information here that uh, we can use potentially and share in our businesses I, or in, I even do. in our personal I, life. Yeah. I'm looking, hold on. I'm, I'm looking for a, a random post-it. I keep them like at the ready at all times. So. Oh, you've just, got a stack. Yeah, it's I got a stack, a, I got there, a stack sir. right here. There we go. Um, a couple of things. For one, and very few people know this, I actually went to a publisher and it, now I'm up to 10 books, by the way, Jonathan. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I know. It's it's like, what are you doing in your idle time? Start typing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I, I've gone to a whole host of different publishers. Not a one wanted to jump on this idea. I, I tried to sell it to them and they were all like, hey, why don't you self-publish or something? And it's, no, I don't do that. Um, but I, I wanted to write a book called Yellow Sticky Project Management. Hmm. And post-it notes, yellow stickies. Mm -hmm. And and all of them said, no, that's uh, that's just a little weird. And two or one, they've all rejected that idea. The reason being is because post-it notes are peerless as being project management tools. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you can get Smartsheet, you can get Microsoft Project or, uh, you know, go ahead and get P6 or whatever. But Post it notes. This is where the data comes from. Mm. Because for my risk class, for example, when I'm teaching risk, I, I always tell people, you know, you need to identify the risk event and the probability and the impact. Mm. And we need to have definitions of what the probability and impact are. And you need to be consistent in how you label probability and impact. That's that's actually what drove me to order my first set of custom post-its. And I've got multiple sets of custom post-its, but this is the one that was handy. Yeah. And as you look at this, you can uh, see, oh, yep. you write the risk on it, and then you put in probability and impact. And then you've got, oh, yeah. Of I course, your information, which which we will talk about at the end of the call. Yeah. yeah but, but be that as it may, you've got probability and impact. And, oh. If you're thinking, Carl, I'm not going to go out and order custom post-its. Oh, oh, you should. You really should because. Yeah, there you go. Oh, my like, gosh. Yeah. A, a, a box of post-its. But the reason you order custom ones yeah. is if you order a thousand decks of post-its, and you'd be surprised how fast you go through post-its. That's what a thousand decks of post-its looks like, by the way. Wow. That big box. Um. If you order a thousand decks, each pad of post-it notes is cheaper than buying it at Staples. Gotcha. And you get to put whatever data you want on it. On mine, you can see I, and it isn't like I, oh, well, did you have a formatting tool? No, I just created a Word document that was the size of a post-it. And I sent it off to the, the promotional company and said, here, make me thousand post a thousand decks of post-its like this Ta-da! and that's what you wind up with now i i use them in risk and i hand them out to people and i say okay now what i'd like you to do for this project i'd like you to identify um on the first post-it i'd like you to identify one risk put down the first post-it grab a second post -it. on the second post-it i'd like you to identify one risk on the third post-it i'd like you to and you keep going it's a process called the Crawford Slip. Huh. And the Crawford Slip is really cool because each time, what are you doing? You're working from a fresh blank slate. It's all clean. And that's that's a really nice thing is every time you're not looking at what you already wrote you're and you're not making a list. Also, if you're dealing, as we are in a lot of projects, if you're dealing with a bunch of introverts, mm. 
a bunch of people who I'm I'm gonna sit in the meeting and hide in the back and pray no one calls on me. Um, if you're dealing with a bunch of introverts, what a wonderful way to leverage them. Ask them the question and say, look, each one of you, I'm only going to ask this question five times. Although if you read the book on the Crawford slip called Mass Interviewing Techniques, um, <laughs> it says 10. You have to absolutely have to start at 10. Uh, if you get to, if you do this on a risk setting, for one, they'll kill you at number seven because they're done. And the last three or four are going to be famine, pestilence, and locusts. They're going <laughs> to just be strange, strange things. But the the cool thing is the post-it is a great way to get people to contribute because then you just collect all the post-its and you've got your very first data set. You, you can use post-it. And now what this one is behind me, the one you sure. were commenting on, mm -hmm. that's agile. Those are agile post-its. And they are user stories, user stories. As a persona, I want outcome because of rationale. Gotcha. And that's a basic user story. And when you're building out user stories, every time I've seen Agile done well, underscore, underscore, done well, their user stories have not been in Jira or some other tool. They've been hanging on a wall as post-it notes. Now, sometimes they will move them or migrate them from there over into Jira. Right. But you know, the reality is you just need to have a set of outcomes. The reason I like this is because it's also what PMI calls an information radiator. Hmm. And that means that people can walk by and see it. And they'll be looking for their post-it. They'll be looking for the one that belongs to them. And when they see it move from being part of the backlog to part of the sprint, oh my gosh, their heart goes pit a pat You know, it's just so exciting because they finally see it moving. They finally see progress being made. And you don't have to go tell them, oh, we still haven't started your crap yet. Yeah, you don't have to do that. You, you're you're fortunate. You're blessed in that all you have to do is just leave it hanging on the wall, and they'll come snooping around to try and find out: Are they doing my stuff yet? Are they ever going to do my stuff? Ta-da! There, the information's theirs. How can and and I like the idea of using pencil and paper. Uh, and why not? Let me ask this question before I jump into. Um, some other other questions. Why 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 use pencil and paper? Why not just do it in Jira? Like most people, or a lot of organizations, just go right to the tool and just say, you know, let's enter all this stuff in. Yeah. Well, for one, it goes to introvert extrovert. Okay. Introverts draw their now, and and most people misconstrue those terms. Most people think of introverts as shy, as being the defining characteristic. That is not an introvert's defining characteristic. The defining characteristic of an introvert is that they draw their energy in a small setting. They draw their energy. They get their life energy in a small setting. Extroverts draw their energy from others. It's like when, when you're in a group setting, like when I'm, I'm with you, I'm teaching a class. This is when I get energized. Mm -hmm. um, but some people, they'd say, oh, you want me to do your podcast, Jonathan? Wow. I'm terrified. I don't want to do a podcast. I'm so and this is like for crying out loud. It's That's just a conversation. Just a, thank yeah. you. It's yeah. just a conversation. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. But part of it goes to the introvert extrovert thing. The other thing is when you're doing it on paper, it goes to how we experience information. We experience information in three ways. Right now, some of you are actually paying attention to the screen. Yeah, you are visual people, and visual people absorb information visually. When I flashed my post-it up real close to the screen, you were trying to read it. You were, you were absorbing information in that moment. You're a visual person. There are people who are aural, audio, and the audio people, frankly, can walk away from the screen and still absorb lots of information. Why? Because they're listeners and they're very good at the active listening practice. And when they actively listen, that's where they process their information. You want to serve them? 
vary your vocal tone. We've all been in that meeting with Ted, <laughs> where he's just talking like this for 45 minutes. Right. Yeah. And it gets really painful. Mm -hmm. Finally, the unheralded subset that gets lost on a lot of people, and a lot of you fall into this category, you are tactile, sense of touch. You're tactile people. And tactile people, tactile recipients of information, write stuff down. I don't care if you're a doodler or a note taker. Either one serves you extraordinarily well. And because most people totally blow off the tactile people, and when you're doing it on a screen in a group setting or a Teams meeting, you, you'll, you'll be sitting there going, any other thoughts? Somebody will toss out an idea or a thought or a user story or a risk or whatever, and you'll be the one typing them in. You put them into the tool there. Ha. Okay, that's good. They get no tactile experience out of it. Mm. As a result, you're losing a third at, at least of your audience. A third of your personnel are pushed off to the wayside because they never get a chance to actually touch it. They never get a chance to feel it. And, and in my book, that's a crime. Got it. So then what, what, here's what I'm thinking. You know, a lot of teams have gone virtual, right? And they have, you know, they're in the cloud, they're on Teams, they're on Zoom, they're on Google Meet. How do we get them involved so that we don't lose the third to tactical, you know, sort yeah. of situations? And so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, actually, there, there's, a, there's a relatively simple answer for that. <laughs> and that is, before the meeting, either have them get a deck of Post-its or a, a piece of paper for crying out loud. Most, most offices still do equip themselves with paper. Yeah, have them get a paper and pen and say, here's what I want you to write down as we go. And if you're doing the Crawford slip, say, I want you to write your first idea down. Go, you've got one minute. And most people can generate a really solid idea in a minute. And you say, okay, put that, you know, put that post-it aside. Another post-it, put down a second idea and just keep going. And cycle through, but have them physically do it in their office. And you might say, well, great. Now that sitting in their office in Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> right. I have no idea. Well, you know, there's this amazing tool. Yeah. <laughs> All they have to do is just arrange them so they'll fit in a single JPEG, click the JPEG, and send it off to you. But what you've done is you've reactivated the whole tactile experience. You've got them back to where they are physically writing stuff down. Got it. And for a big chunk of anybody who's on your team and your audience, whatever the case might be, you have just re-energized them and given them cause to remember what the devil it was you were saying. Got it. So then once they've, uh, say, sent that, uh, that JPEG over, then we conclude the meeting and then, you know, we do the the combining of all of the JPEGs, if you will, into some sort of tool, maybe like Miro or, or something like that. Or Jira for that matter. You know, or you Jira. Put it wherever you want, but the idea being you put it collectively in a space, but you now have all, all the same data you would have as if they had been in the same room. Interesting. And I'm, I'm still a big fan of putting people in the same room. And COVID trashed that for a lot of us. And by the way, just because it was COVID then, and uh, Carl, COVID's back in a, with a vengeance in case you haven't heard. Yeah, I know, but I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I No, I'm a firm believer. We need physical contact with okay. other human beings. And the more we can do to actually emulate that and bring it closer if 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 you are diseased, paranoid, okay, fine, but you've still got to find ways to tap all three: oral, visual, and tactile. Gotcha. You've really got to make sure you're hitting all three. So then let's let's see if we can you know maybe bring it down to some of the uh, the people who may be listening as you know entrepreneurs, as people who may be investors, 
who are trying to to do what they do, or even project managers who have a large project, you know, work breakdown structure type stuff, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, it sounds like this particular, you know, method that you have, maybe, you know, doing their own custom post-it notes would be a good idea to to great, create those checklists and put them on their physical wall before organizing them potentially and putting them into some, you know, some some virtual uh, virtual landing page. What what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I I think all I can say is amen. So then yeah. what you have on your wall right now, does that exist somewhere virtually? Uh, it would if I weren't just using it for teaching purposes. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. You no, I, I keep that on my wall just to explain to people how you can use this in particular in the Agile environment. Exactly. And so for those who haven't taken the Agile course, uh, project management, PM, PMI has one, right? Yeah. Uh, well, but it's, it, and fundamentally what it is, is it's about breaking work down. And we talk about this all the time, sure. break work down into manageable chunks. My manageable chunks for a given day, they're here. Mine are micro chunks, minor activities rather than your know, tasks, if you prefer, rather than full blown work. But by the same token, this is how work gets done in small incremental steps. And there's something about if, if, if you're working in this kind of environment where you've written them all on post-it notes, going up to the wall and pulling off post-its, crumpling them up and throwing them away is a moment of triumph. Mm. It's a moment of glory because you get to go, oh, look at that. I'm done. Hurrah. Good for me. Just like the check mark on the, uh, on the checklist that you've created as well. It's, it's a wonderful yeah. thing to say that you've done it. And you've set yourself at 15. Why, why did you choose, choose 15 for, for the day that that's, that's triumph? It's, it's manageable. I normally, I, at, at first I didn't even have that on the top of my checklist page, but what happened over time is I'd realized I'd hit 15 around three o'clock in the afternoon, three 30. And that's when you're starting to, if you get up and you start your day at eight, that's when you're starting to flag a little bit, you know, by, by the time three o'clock rolls around, it's kind of like, check please. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm done with this. Yeah. And um so it got to the point where I was I was finding I could do 15 pretty much every day. I wouldn't hit it a lot earlier than three, but I, you know, and if I got to three o'clock and I crap, I'm only at twelve. The nice thing was I still had enough time to actually look down the list and go, Oh, that's right, I've got to send that proposal out. Gotta get that out the door. Yeah, I can do that in a half hour. That's one more I'll get. And then I'd look down the list. Oh, walk the dog. Yeah. And By then the you, you, you'd you be yeah. able to get through them. I mean, because you, you 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 remain pretty active. I guess that helps you get your 10,000 steps. So 2024 is here. We're recording this at the beginning of 2024. Yeah. Uh, for those who may be listening a little bit later, what are your thoughts about 2024? And, you know, is there anything to uh, to, I guess, look forward to or any other... You know, I, yeah. I've taken a course with you about, uh, you know, estimating the future or, you know, uh, how, how, to, how, how to think about future things, you know, how is it going to be, et cetera. But I want to hear if you have anything that's, uh, that's earth shattering and, uh, you know, how should we look at 2024? Looking into my crystal ball, um, looking into the crystal ball, the reality is 2024 is going to be so much like what we've seen in the past few years. The media is going to drive us crazy. I'm allowed to say that as a former member of the media. So yeah, I was. That's right. Director. You were. That's right. Yeah. You were news director and and you were DJ for a while, right? Uh, no, I was the news guy. That's uh, this is my this is my, yeah. See the dark hair on this guy. It's hard <laughs> to see from there, but it's attached to my wall. Um, this is uh, my 1980. Seven congressional press pass. Wow. Okay. So yeah. yeah, you were the media guy. Yeah, I was the media guy. I would. Yeah. The, how awful is that? But um, I, I, and I, I don't think the world is going to change. I will have an election, and people will go, "Oh no, we elected," and it's all going to fall apart. It's not going to fall apart. By the way, to survive twenty twenty four. Let me offer you a suggestion. 
write down your prediction of the worst case scenario. Seriously. Some of you are thinking, well, if he gets elected, I'm doomed. I'm, yeah, and it's like, okay, fine. Go ahead and write down the worst case scenario in your world. Write them all down and make a list of at least four or five. Just make a quick list. Then I want you to save it on your calendar with a reminder behind it. And what I want it to do is I want it to pop up just before Christmas 2024. I want it to pop up because what's going to happen is it's going to pop up and you're going to look at it and go, well, none of these things have happened yet. They will. It's going to be awful. And no, you know, what you're going to find out is all your worst case scenarios did not come to pass. Okay. And, and frankly, that's, you know, you're wondering what 2024 is going to bring. I could lay out a million doomsday scenarios. I really could. What 2024 is going to bring is time. It's buying you a full 365 days, or now with a few months knocked off, maybe 300 days. But it's buying you a boatload of time, and time is the only non-renewable resource. Mm -hmm. We can't get time back. So as a result, what you should be doing is trying to find ways to leverage your time and things that you find satisfaction. And I mentioned walking the dog. Yes, it helps me get to my 10,000 steps, but it's also a matter of, I have a relationship with our dog, Mocha. I do. I love my dog. Mm -hmm. I really do. And it's, it's beautiful because this is my chance to get out, get away from my desk, get away from my laptop and go do something functional. And I'll bump into neighbors when it's not freezing cold outside, but I'll bump into neighbors and we'll, you know, hey, how's it going? Oh, I don't know. Did you hear Dave passed away? You know, that kind of, yeah, pick up all the local news along the way. You have a much more positive experience, but you've got 300 days to work with and you shouldn't squander them. Every single one is an amazing opportunity. You never know that tomorrow might not be the best day of your entire life. Exactly. Question. So um, saying that brings up two more questions that I have for you about the future and just, you know, technology advancements. You, you've, you've, you've seen the rise of the personal computer and you knew when there was no such thing as a, you know, personal computer or even a cell phone that wasn't as heavy as a brick. You know, you, you knew when, uh, you know, the dot-com era came, you know, you, you saw how email uh, came up as a new technology and we have two, you know, I guess burgeoning ones that everybody's talking about, one of them, uh, one, not so much. And I'm going to ask you about that one. What do you think about, you know, blockchain? Um, uh, blockchain, I think so many people will have, I, and my understanding is this big. Yeah. But blockchain, I think has, has a lot of potential to actually show value. And I think that's the real thing is when you're looking for value blockchain as, as manifested in Bitcoin, for example, shows the value of the virtual, which is something that we, we generally don't get to really see most things that are pitched as being, Hey, we've got a great idea for a virtual and, oh, well, that's real nice, but what are you actually making? Mm. What are you actually producing? Blockchain lets you have an answer for that, whereas a lot of other technologies don't. Gotcha. So, yeah, you know, the others are, well, it frees you up for, okay, fine. But that's not what blockchain is all about. Right. So, so you want to, so, so there is a value proposition, just hasn't fully been realized. And then, of course, yeah. the second technology is artificial intelligence. Yeah. What are your thoughts about this on the coming horizon? Oh, Ed, your timing is impeccable just because I'm, I'm actually read up on this. Ah. And, and that is, um, I, uh, I've been using chat open AI yep. and chat GBT, um, and I, I, which I dearly love because you can go in there and you can ask almost anything. And it goes to beware the answers. That's my big warning on AI because I, I, I did, some, did some homework and I was writing an article. And as I was writing it, I said, I went on chat 
and I typed in a question. I said, and I said, answer this question. And it gave me an answer. And I said, now, and I put in the exact same question. And I said, now, please answer this question as if you were Groucho Marx. <laughs> and it was the question I'm trying to, oh, it was, how do you imbue your team with a sense of urgency? Mm. Yeah. Okay. How do you, yeah, which is a good question. And by the way, for the investor side, it's how do you invest your customer with a sense of urgency? Mm -hmm. And I asked it and I, and I said, now answer as Groucho Marx. And it came back with, you know, give them rewards like a, a set of Groucho glasses and a rubber <laughs> nose with a mustache, you know. And it was like, wow, it was totally bizarre. It was a, it was a set of 10 very bizarre answers. Put, plugged in the exact same question, erased the word Groucho and put in Carl. Uh. Carl Marx. And it was all about, you know, the collective and how we should all work together and how we are workers toward a common goal and it was, it was like ah oh, wow that remind me not, not to party with you <laughs> but but it was noteworthy in that chat ai actually went in and and was able to give me answers from different perspectives and no matter how much we invest ourselves in ai it's coming at us with a bias it's coming at us with a perspective and better that you go ahead and say, okay, fine, come at it with um, Ronald Reagan's perspective. Come at it with Lyndon Johnson's perspective. But if you're if you're going to go back in history or if you're going to go forward, when you're asking questions, don't just assume, oh, well, here's a pure, solid, unbiased response to my query. The reality is AI has an opinion. And even if it doesn't appear, even if you didn't ask for an opinion, you're getting one. And I think that's probably my big, I, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's a curse mm. because uh, it, it's a blessing in that you at least can go ahead and get a mountain of information without having to waffle through the entire internet. Thank you, Google. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but now you're challenged by the notion of what bias is in there. I'd rather ask it the question, answer this as if you are Cinderella and Tinkerbell. I, I'd much rather have it go ahead and answer the question that way with that kind of Disney-esque sunshine and roses answer than to just say, just give me an answer. Because at least I know the, where the bias is coming from. Mm. It's coming from, you know, Tinkerbell's little magic wand. Select the uh, persona, you know, when when in, interfacing with uh, with AI. Very yeah. interesting. Well, listen, Carl, I want to say thank you again for uh, taking some time out to share some sage words of wisdom. I'm glad to hear that you have another, I'm going to say, 20 years with us. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward that. to your book. It's called the, uh, what is that stage, again? The Stage 4 Cancer Project. Go and uh, register and find that book. If uh, if it's out already, get it. I'm sure that you will uh, definitely enjoy the message and the humor that Carl brings to us. And Carl, how can people get in contact with you? Uh, my email is is just about the simplest way, and it's just about as simple as I could make it. It's Carl, C-A-R-L, at Carl Pritchard. And Pritchard is spelled with a T in the middle of it, P-R-I-T-C-H-A-R-D. Carl at carlpritchard.com. Don't send it to carl at pritchard.com. I got a hold of them and told them I'd love to get a forwarding email from that. <laughs> and uh, they're a company up in Canada. And they were like, we don't do that. <laughs> I I'm understand. Like, oh, okay. But yeah, so it's carl at carlpritchard.com. If you do email me, I'll always get back to you within 24 hours. If you didn't hear back from me, I'm in your spam folder. There you go. And he is very uh, responsive. I, I can tell I can tell you to attest to that. Last question for you. We always ask all of our guests at the end of the uh, uh, of the podcast, if there is one piece of advice, we'd like to give people the boot here, if you will, for Red Boot. If there's one piece of advice that you would give, there you go, I had to point the opposite direction. Um, we want to give people the boot about, you know, to spur them on to go and do the next thing. What would that piece of advice be at this point in time? Baby step, take 
I, I don't care what it is that we talked about today. Get a deck of post-its down at your office supply store. Maybe um, just post a list of things you've got to do on the wall or or build start building a checklist that makes sense in your world. But one small thing. You don't have to do everything we talked about. One small thing. That gets you on the road to the other 299 days. Well, well listen, Carl, thank you again for uh, everything as always. And uh, if there's anything that we can do for you here, please let us know and uh, we'll be right there for you. I'll scream real loud. Thanks. Absolutely.